Hello again, and welcome to Introductory Statistics. We are continuing to cover descriptive statistics in this video. Last time we talked about graphs and measures of center, uh, the center of our data values, our data distribution. This time we're going to talk about measures of spread, how spread out our data distribution is, and a related topic, the empirical rule. As always, when you're watching these videos, be ready with your formula card, your calculator, and the lecture notes for these videos, and you can write on top of those lecture notes as we go along. Uh, the formula card and the calculator should be used on every single thing that you do in the course, so hopefully you will always have the formula card and the calculator right there with you. Uh, these lecture notes will also be useful when you're doing the homework and the quizzes. Uh, the textbook will be very useful when you're doing discussions and projects, uh, and you can kind of use all of those in anything that's outside of the exams. Uh, the first two, the formula card and the calculator, will be available on your exams as well. Uh, so let's jump right into this. Uh, the first measure of center that we're going to talk about is the range. We really only have two measures of center, um, the range and the standard deviation. The range is simply the maximum data value minus your minimum data value. Value. So here, um, if we're dealing in inches, 78 would be the maximum data value and 72 would be the minimum data value on our team 1. So 78 minus 72 is 6. I hope I'm right on that. Um, if I do get arithmetic wrong, and I do, uh, arithmetic is my Achilles heel, I'm actually not very good at arithmetic. Algebra was where I started getting really good at math. but um, So Please forgive me if I do get arithmetic wrong, because it will happen. Uh, and then we have 84 minus 67, uh, and so 84 minus 67 is 17, I think. But you may want to whip out your calculator and check my math on that. Or, if you're much better at arithmetic than I am, you might say, yeah, that's not right, even if you don't whip out your calculator. Um, but this is definitely, look at the difference here. This one's almost three times. Um, as much as this one. So uh, this one, the heights um, are almost all the same. And this one you have a, well, I can't draw a straight line to save my life. Um, but this one, we definitely have a lot more variability in our line and our heights. Um, so we have some shorter basketball players. Five seven's pretty short for a basketball player. It's pretty tall for somebody who is in my family. Um, but it's, uh, it's short for a basketball player, definitely. And uh, seven feet is definitely tall, even for a basketball player. So um, there's a lot more variability in team two. Uh, and that's the range. It's just the maximum minus the minimum. The standard deviation takes every value into account. So um, in our range, we kind of ignored the guys in the middle, right? We just looked at the tallest and the shortest. Um, so we ignored the guys in the middle. With a standard deviation, we don't ignore any data value. Um, so it's kind of like when you look at the median, it's not taking very much into account except position. Um, and that's the same with range. It's just taking the positions of those maximum and minimum into account. Um, whereas the mean takes every data value into account. And here the same is true of the standard deviation. So for that reason, the mean, um, if you don't have extreme skewness or outliers, the mean is the best measure because it takes every data value into account. Here, standard deviation is the best measure because it takes every data value into account. Uh, now, how does it do that? Uh, well, to talk about how the standard deviation is computed, we need to talk about what a deviation is. Um, so x represents our data value, and x with this bar on top, and I'll often call it just x bar, um, x with bar on top is our sample mean. Um, so um, that is M-E-A-N. Hopefully you're writing in better handwriting on your uh, lecture notes, but that's the sample mean. You may want to write sample here too. Um, and then uh, a deviation um, is positive if it falls above. So um, if it's positive, then the data value is more than the mean um, because you're doing x minus x bar. So if the data value is more than the mean, then it's going to be positive. Um, and if it's less than the mean, it's going to be negative because uh, if this is smaller than what you're subtracting from it, you're going to get a negative number. Uh, and then if it's exactly the same, it's going to be zero, of course. So like if we take the Honey Smack cereal and we look and we subtract the average, we're going to get a negative number. Um, but if we take the Honey Nut Cheerios, um, which being positive here, 
means more sodium, so not a good thing. Um, but if we take the Honey Nut Cheerios and we subtract the average, then we are going to get a positive number. And uh, so you would first have to compute the average, of course, and then you take every single data value and you subtract the average from it. But then if we were to average these deviations, what do you think we would get? Well, some would be negative and some would be positive, and you would get an average of zero, which wouldn't tell you much because every single data set would have an average deviation of zero. So that's not going to be very helpful. What we need to do is we need the negatives not to cancel out the positives. And how can we do that? Well, there are a couple of ways. Um, we could absolute value or we could square them. Uh, and it turns out we're going to square them. And so the standard deviation formula is that we take these deviations and we square them. And then we have that crazy sigma again, which just means we're going to add all those squared deviations up together, and we're going to divide by how many there are, except that we're dividing by n minus 1. And the students have asked me, why did we divide by n minus 1? The truth is, I'm not actually really sure. Um, but I do know that if this were sigma, if this were the population standard deviation, in other words, if we had all of our data, we wouldn't be dividing by n minus 1, we'd divide by n. Uh, and I think the reason they change it to n minus 1 for s is because of the uncertainty in s. So s is, we're using s to estimate sigma, um, and this is the lowercase sigma, by the way, that stands for the population standard deviation. So this is for the entire population. It represents the same standard deviation, but this is the entire population standard deviation. So if we were doing sigma, it would do n instead of n minus 1, um, but we have s here, and we're less certain of s because if we do a different sample, we're going to get a different date, set of data values, and they'll give you a different s. Um, so I think that's why they make s a little bit bigger by making the denominator a little bit smaller. Um, so that's just kind of a compensation technique. And, and I'm sure of that answer. Um, I'm not sure why they chose exactly n minus 1, um, but I do know that this is a compensation technique because we are uncertain of what s is. And then we take the square root to undo the squaring. So we squared here, so we want to undo that. So that's why we have the square root. And uh, so this is a lot um, when you actually put into practice. Even for our very small data set, uh, we're going to use our very small data set of the basketball player heights that we had um, at the very beginning of our video where we computed the range. Uh, so this, we had a height, and this is team one, by the way. Um, we had the homogeneous heights of 72 inches and 73 inches and 76 inches and 76 inches and then 78 inches. Um, if we were to add all of those together, then that's going to give us a total of 375 inches. So we have 375 inches when we add these five together. Uh, and then if we divide by five, because that's our formula for the mean, is to add up all the data values and divide by how many there are, there are five, um, then we get 75. And so, of course, here we're going to do x. This is our x. Um, this is our x column. I should have put x here. Um, there we go. It's there now. <laughs> um, so we're going to do x minus x bar. So we're going to subtract 75 from each of these. Um, and so when we do 72 minus 75, what are we going to get? Negative 3, because 72 is less than 75, so we'll get negative 3. And then 73 minus 75, we'll get negative 2. 76 minus 75, we'll get 1 on both of those, of course. And then 78 minus 75, we'll get 3. Um, and then if we add all these together, just like I said, always when you add all the deviations together, you're just going to get zeros because they all cancel each other out. So that's not helpful. But now what we're going to do is we're going to square all these deviations. Um, so x minus x bar is what we have in this column, and we're just going to square them. So we're going to square negative 3. And when you square negative 3, you'll, if you're doing your calculator, be sure to put parentheses around it so that the negative is in the inside of the parentheses, because if you don't and you just do negative 3 squared, it's going to square the 3 and leave the negative outside, and it'll give you negative 9. But that's not actually true. It's actually positive 9. Every number becomes either 0 or positive when you square it. Uh, and so squaring all these, we will get um, 9, as I said. Negative 2 squared is 4. 1 squared is 1. And then 3 squared is 9 as well. So whether it's positive or negative, it becomes uh, positive over here. 
And then uh, if we add up 9 and, oh, well, actually what I did was 9 and 1, and 9 and 1 to get us 10 and 10, or 20, and then the 4, um, and that becomes 24. So our, this is our, our, this column is our x minus x bar squared, and then when we add up the whole column, we get the sum of x minus x bar squared. And then this sum of x minus x bar squared is 24, so this whole numerator here um, is, is what 24 is. So we don't have to square 24, we don't have to sum 24, we've already done all those things. Um, so this 24 becomes this 24. Uh, and then the denominator is n minus 1, so our n is 5, and so that's where um, there are 5 data values, so 5 minus 1. Um, and then 24 divided by 4, because 5 minus 1 is 4, 24 divided by 4 ends up being 6, and the square root of 6, which I had to whip out the calculator to do that, um, is 2.449. Uh, so this is a lot, and imagine if you had 30 data values. Um, so this becomes very, very complicated. But the good news is that the calculator will do all of the work for us um, in a much, much easier fashion. So um, we don't have to know any of these things. We can just... Uh, to say stat edit um, 72, 73, 76, 76, 78. Uh, so when you're entering your data, be sure to enter it and check. I don't think I did that in the last video, but that's probably the most important step. I did it before I created the last video, so I've already double checked my data, but I should have done it in the video as a good example because it, uh, the most important step when you're using the calculator to compute stuff and you're putting in data values, the most important step is to double check every single data value to make sure you had it right. If I was doing a quiz or an exam, I would not just double check, I would triple check. And I might even quadruple check if I had plenty of time uh, to make sure that that data was absolutely correct. And then, whip out your formula card and it says go to stat, scroll to calc, and hit one bar stats. This will, <laughs> this basically, this function does almost everything for this chapter. Um, and then we don't have a frequency list, so I just went to calculate and hit enter. And we can scroll down to see some stuff, but we don't need to scroll down to see our sample standard deviation, which is represented by S. Um, and it happens to do SX to say, if, if we had done two var stats instead of one var stats, it would have given us the L1 list as our X's and the L2 list as our Y's. And so it would have given us x bar and y bar for the mean of the x's and the mean of the y's and would have given us sx for the mean of the x's um, which is our l1 and sy for the sample standard deviation of our l2 or our y values but here we only have one set of values so this is really just the same as s and this is the same as sigma um, we don't ever use sigma though because we never put our entire population into our calculators. Our populations are usually too large to put into our calculators, so we always really just use the S here. Um, we don't usually use these options either, so we'll use X bar, we'll use S. We'll, we can use N, um, but oftentimes we already know N or we can just count N. Uh, and then the last five numbers are our five number summary. Uh, so the S that we get here is our 2.449, and if you'll remember, that's exactly what we had uh, when we did our calculations uh, by hand, is we got 2.449. And trust me that the calculator is much faster. Uh, so the calculator will save you an hour or two or three on this homework. But overall, in the entire course, it'll save you much more than that, especially when we get to uh, some of the stuff in like chapters 8, 9, and 12, the calculator will work some miracles there. And then percentile. Um, so if we were to compute the 90th percentile for a data set, what we would do is we would use this formula and we would compute the I or the index. And the index will tell us um, which number that we want. Uh, and if it's not a whole number, which it's usually not a whole number, then what you'll do is you'll average the two nearest numbers. Uh, so let's go ahead and do this for this data set. Um, we'll do the 90th percentile like it's shown here. And uh, so our K is going to be uh, the 90. 
Um, so 90, because we want the 90th percentile, the kth percentile. Um, 90 divided by 100. And then our n is our sample size. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 data values. Um, at, but we add 1, so 7 plus, oops, <laughs> I didn't mean to hit the store key. 7 plus 1, and then close our parenthesis. And that gives us 7.2. And with 7.2, normally what we would do is we would take the 7th data value and the 8th data value, and we would average them. Here, we don't even actually have an 8th data value, so we'll just take the 7th data value as our 90th percentile. Um, let's do another example. Um, let's do the 80th percentile for this one so that we get uh, something that we can actually see how it's different. Um, so the 80th percentile, we would use 80 as our K, and we get 6.4. Um, 6.4, this is our sixth data value, and this is our seventh data value. So we would just average 41 and 47. Um, and if you couldn't do that in your head, then you can always use the handy dandy calculator to do it for you. Um, so add the two numbers together and divide by two uh, to get the average. And anytime you're putting in uh, a fraction that has a complicated numerator or a complicated denominator, then put parentheses around the things that are complicated. So anytime you have a fraction in the calculator and it's complicated on the numerator or the denominator, be sure to put those parentheses around the complicated parts so that it will definitely do it in the order that you intend for it to work that problem. Uh, and so those are percentiles and how we can compute percentiles. Uh, related to percentiles is the idea of quartiles. So like 25th percentile um, would be the first quartile, the 50th percentile would be the second quartile, also known as the median, and the 75th percentile would be um, the third quartile. Uh, you can call them quartiles and you can compute them um, as you do percentiles, or um, there's actually a different way to compute them as well. Uh, so you can compute them like you compute the median. So order the data from least to greatest, the number that's in the middle, or the two numbers that are in the middle averaged together, will be your median, just like we computed in the last uh, video. But if you want Q1, um, then what you do is you take the first half of the data set. And we don't include the median. If the median's part of the data set, we don't include the median in the first half or the second half, we leave it out of both. Um, so the first half would be right here and the second half would be right here. And then we go and we find the number that's in the middle. Well, in the middle is right between six and seven because there's six before and there's six after. Um, so we're going to average just like we would if we were computing the median. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're computing the median of the first half of the data set. Um, so this is the first half of the data set and when we average those two numbers together we'll get 2.2. Um, this is the second half of the data set and when we average these two numbers together we get 4.35. And so that's how you can compute quartiles um, or you could have used the percentile method and computed the index with the index formula. The index formula by the way is on your formula card. Um, that's I took this straight from the formula card actually so this is a screenshot of your formula card. This part isn't on your formula card. Uh, if you think you might forget it, write it on your formula card. Um, but the things that are written on your formula card, be sure to memorize before you actually go in to take the exam. Um, so if I isn't an integer, be sure to remember that you average the two data values that are around the ith um, value. Uh, and so again, you could compute quartiles that way, or you could compute them this way, or Better yet, you could compute them with your calculator. So um, on the calculator, we can uh, go ahead and make sure there's still data in there. Yep, stat, calc, one bar stats, calculate, go to the bottom, and this is our Q1, this is our Q2, and this is our Q3. So three different ways to compute quartiles. I would, of course, use the calculator most of the time. Uh, and then the five number summary, uh, we just computed it too. This is the five number summary, the minimum, the Q1, the median, 
the Q3 and the maximum. So you've got your FOG number summary there as well. Um, so the minimum data value is your Q1. So minimum, and then the second number of the FOG number summary is Q1, and then the third is Q2, and the fourth is Q3, and the fifth is your maximum data value. So you'll have your minimum here and your maximum here. And that just kind of uh, tells you the spread of your data set in terms of quartiles uh, and separates it all into quarters. It also sets us up nicely for the box plot. Um, oh, and identifying outliers. Uh, so we'll talk about the box plot too, which will have outliers in it. Um, so our major definition, we actually have two definitions of how to compute outliers, but our primary definition of how to compute outliers is we take the third quartile and we add and subtract the interquartile range. What is the interquartile range? Well, the formula card tells you that the interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. So uh, here, if we go to this example, our Q3 is 77 and our Q1 is 72.5. So 77 minus 72.5 um, will give us our interquartile range. And then we would do 77 uh, plus 1.5 times our interquartile range of 4.5. And we would do 72 and a half. Um, let's go to the formula card first though. Um, because where I'm getting all of this stuff from is from the formula card. Uh, and I want you to, to see that um, just in case you didn't have it right there and I want to highlight it for you. Uh, so the interquartile range, Q3 minus Q1, um, this was our Q3 and this was our Q1. So that's where we got that one from. And then outliers are anything that are above Q3 plus 1.5 IQR. So this is Q3 plus 1.5. This was our IQR that we just computed, the interquartile range. Um, and so that's where we got that from. And now what I'm about to do is Q1. My Q1 is the 72.5. Um, and then I'm going to do minus, um, and let me highlight what I'm doing right here, um, Q1 minus, uh, and then the 1.5 uh, times the 4.5. And so any data value that was above 83.75 inches, and we did not have any data values above that height. Um, we'll, we'll go look at our data in just a second. Any data values below 65.75, we did have data values close to that height, but I think 67 inches was our minimum height. Let's go look at it. Oh, actually our minimum height was 72 inches. Um, it must have been team two that had that five foot seven player that I was thinking about. Um, and 78 inches is our uh, tallest height, so we definitely don't have anything uh, that's an outlier in team one. Uh, we may not have even had anything that was an outlier in Team 2, but we, these aren't for Team 2. These are for Team 1. Uh, so that's how we would compute outliers. And if they're, you, you actually go back to the original data values, um, like I just did, and you look to see, is there anything above your, your first computation? Is there anything below the second computation? And if there is then that those all of the data values that are above or all of the data values that are below, those are the outliers. But if you don't have any in your data set that are above and you don't have any in your data set that are below, then you don't have any outliers. So a lot of times you won't even have any outliers. Um, but if you do have outliers, they will always be above um, the Q3 plus 1.5 IQR or below the Q1 minus 1.5 IQR. And then we will use the five number summary and the outliers to determine how to draw our box plot. Uh, so uh, box plot has a box. Um, you can see the colored boxes here. The red, green, and blue boxes are the box. The box goes from the interquartile range. So we have um, three different box plots on this graph. Uh, and the again, the boxes go for the whole interquartile range from Q3 Q1 at the bottom to Q3 at the top. And then this line that bisects the boxes, or doesn't necessarily have to bisect it in the middle, but that cuts the boxes, um, that's Q2. Uh, so you have Q1, Q2, and Q3 represented by the boxes. And then the whiskers go from Q1 to the minimum, 
the minimum data value, and then this one goes from Q3 to the maximum data value that's not an outlier. Um, and then we have our outlier marked right here. Uh, and the same would really be true below. This is the minimum data value that's not an outlier. And if we had outliers, we would mark them with an asterisk or a dot or some, some sort of little singularity uh, would be marked out here. And so that's your box plot. You can do box plots, histograms. Um, I think those are the only two for this chapter. Uh, the only two graphs for this chapter for both box plots and histograms you can do on the calculator there's a separate calculator video that you can watch for how to do histograms and box plots and uh, but this is I think the calculator might have them horizontal um, instead of vertical so uh, you might see box plots that would have um, would have like the box drawn like this for instance instead of um, the vertical so it would have it drawn out horizontally and the calculator may draw it that way too but I know Minitab does this format uh, and then box plots are great for comparing different distributions as you can see here because uh, you can tell that the red dose um, is significantly less than the other two doses. Uh, you have an outlier of the red dose uh, being more, but certainly um, you, your red dose or half and half of a unit or whatever is going to be uh, giving you much less results than the green or the blue dose. Um, and so you've got um, really only the upper quarter matches anything of the green or anything of the blue um, and very little of that is matched. Uh, and then you can even compare the blue and the green to, to show you that only the lower quarter of the blue, um, uh, the lower and middle, actually I guess three quarters of the blue match the green, but the top two quarters of the blue only match, or the bottom, or the middle two quarters of the blue only match the top quarter of the green. So um, you definitely are able to do a lot of comparisons uh, between distributions using the box plots, whereas you wouldn't be able to compare them so easily using other methods. And then we have the empirical rule that's related to the standard deviation. So if we go one standard deviation on either side of the mean, a single standard deviation on either side of the mean, that's going to give us 68% of our data. So 68% of our data values will be here in this uh, green area. And then if we go out two standard deviations, so we go another sigma here and another sigma here for a total of two standard deviations to the right, of the mean and two standard deviations to the left of the mean, then that's going to be 95% of our data. So in the aqua, um, adding the aqua and the green together, we would have 95% of all of our data is within two standard deviations. And when I say within two standard deviations, that means two standard deviations on the right side of the distribution and two standard deviations on the left side of the distribution. So two standard deviations this way and two standard deviations this way. Um, and again this is one standard deviation this way and one standard deviation this way. And then if we go out three standard deviations on either side of our data, three standard deviations, um, that would be this way and this way, that's going to give us um, what we call in this chapter all or nearly all of our data. This is going to be three standard deviations. Um, and uh, then in chapters um, seven, I think, or maybe six, um, six and seven and beyond, we start saying specifically that 99.7% um, of our data values. So it's not, it's not all if we have a very large data set. Um, it's 99.7% of our data values, which if you have a thousand data values, it's going to be all but three data values. So you can see how anything that's not 
within three standard deviations. If you've got a normal distribution, this nice normal um, bell-shaped curve. Um, so if, if it has this nice normal bell-shaped curve or approximately a bell shape on the curve, um, then it's going to be, uh, so let me try to draw this in a different color. So if you have this nice normal bell-shaped curve, um, then you know that these empirical rule values should follow. And you know that anything outside of three standard deviations should be an outlier. So um, that's kind of the premise of the empirical rule. And we can compute z-scores to tell us how many standard deviations we are above or below the mean. So a z-score tells us the number of standard deviations above the mean and the number of standard deviations below the mean. If it's positive, if our z-score is positive, um, so you see one, two, three, that's positive, then we know that we're above the mean, and if our z-score is negative, then we know we are below the mean. So here, for instance, if I wanted to compute the z-score for 115, um, my observed data value is the x data value, of 115, and then my observed mean data value, I can see it right here on the uh, chart. My mean is in the center, as I would expect it to be. Um, so whenever you have a perfectly normal distribution, your mean and your median and your mode are all exactly in the center. That's how I knew the 100 would be my mean. So this is 115. Hopefully you're writing more neatly on your paper. Um, and then I don't know my standard deviation by the chart, um, but I have deduced that it was 15 um, based on the z-scores that they've computed. So 115 minus 100, if we put this in the calculator all at once, be sure to put parentheses around that. So 115 minus 100 will give us 15, and then 15 divided by 15 will give us 1, so our z-score would be 1. And that's where I got the 15 from, by the way. And then if we do 130 minus 100, we get 30 divided by 15, or 2. And if we do 145 minus 100, we would get 3. Um, and the same thing for 85 minus 100, we get negative 15, negative 30, and negative 45, which will, um, when we divide by 15, will then give us negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3. So that's how you compute the z-scores. Um, and then if we happen to have uh, data values that were less than 55 or more than 145, on a normal distribution, we would consider those outliers. Um, so you have kind of two different ways to compute outliers. Always use the quartile way to compute outliers. And by the way, if you draw a box plot, a modified box plot using your calculator, um, it will show you uh, the outliers as asterisk. And you can see that in the modified in the box plot histogram video. If you watch that, it will tell you about how to tell outliers on the calculator using the box plot. Um, but then this is our second way. Unless you're explicitly told, and I think on one of the projects you are explicitly told, to use the empirical rule um, definition of outliers, the z-score definition of outliers, unless you're explicitly told or explicitly told that it is a normal distribution or that you are assuming it's a normal distribution, you shouldn't use this method of outliers because if you have a skewed distribution um, and it's not perfectly normal, then you're going to get different answers using the quartile method and using this method. Uh, so this method is really just for perfectly normal data. Um, so unless you're told to assume your data is perfectly normal um, and to use this method, go ahead and go with the, the quartile, the IQR method that we talked about earlier for outliers. Uh, and then that's it. Uh, so we have covered the, um, all the major topics in our descriptive statistics chapter. Uh, as you go through and do the discussions, the homeworks, the projects, and the quizzes, don't forget your most important tools, the formula card and the calculator. Um, particularly for discussions and projects, you'll want to use your textbook as well um, for uh, your homework and your quizzes, your lecture notes will be particularly valuable, and you may want to take advantage of some of that Newton instruction too, especially if you're having difficulty getting through the homework. Um, as always, once you've finished with these and you're still stuck and frustrated, please, please, please message me and ask me questions and I will uh, be there to especially support uh, the homework. Um, and uh, I will give you hints on discussions, projects, and quizzes on where to go. Uh, thank you, and good luck.